So I'm Rose Higgins. I'm a health data scientist in the NHS Service Analytics team at the Bennett Institute. Um, and I'll be chairing the session. Uh, and we're going to be covering a bit of the history of open prescribing, some of the um, technical and data underpinnings of open prescribing, uh, and then talking through some kind of research that we do with the data and with the tool itself. Um, yeah, so feel free during the, during the uh, session to ask questions on, online, and if you, if you aren't able to get access somehow, then please raise your hand, and I think we have someone who's got a phone who can come out and help. Um, so I'm just going to run through, so these are our funders, uh, as you mentioned before. Um, so first of all, I'm just going to talk through a bit of the history of open prescribing. So it started in 2015, so Ben joined the um, Nuffield Department for Primary Care Health Sciences, um, had a somewhat modest grant for himself and one software developer, um, Anna, and they chose to work on, open, on prescribing data for a few reasons, um, primarily because uh, the uh, national prescribing data is open, so there was no long, arduous and very lengthy information governance processes. Um, it was available, uh, so, and GPs were very familiar with it um, and had been kind of seeing it, very comfortable with it. I think one of the earliest records we have is, is from the kind of 60s in the data set. And it's also very important to the NHS. So um, primary care annual spend is £9 billion, pounds, um, which covers about 1.1 million pres a billion prescriptions every year. So um, uh, with that in mind, they started working on this data set and produced the first beta version of open prescribing in December of 2015, which initially had an analysis page, so more of that in the demo, um, and then six prescribing measures. So as Will's just alluded to, we're very, very fanatical about our open, our open working methods. So this is the first commit for open prescribing, as you can see, um, committed by uh, Anna Powell Smith on the 2nd of December in 2015. So all of this is online in our EBM Data Lab uh, organization in our open prescribing repo. Uh, so what exactly is open prescribing? It is an interactive tool used by um, GPs, pharmacists, uh, NHS managers, journalists and members of the public um, to understand prescribing behavior both nationally and locally. Um, it has detailed um, item and spend data over time, um, locally and nationally. It uses the um, English prescribing data set, which is published by the NHS BSA. Um, and to date, uh, we now have over 100 prescribing uh, quality metrics or measures. Um, and these cover loads of different areas. Um, uh, for example, antimicrobial stewardship, various clinical domains, um, green, green NHS, and the investment impact fund NHS. And it's very popular. So we have 25,000 unique monthly users and 5,000 email alert subscribers as well. And we're very excited that people use this. It's open. Um, and this is available to the public, uh, both through them accessing it and through a lot of reporting that we have from <coughs> journalists, um, detailing kind of things that are useful and in important for the public to know around prescribing and medicine. So we've had some great coverage from Sky and Channel 4 on opioids and um, drug shortage spikes. And then we have these kind of very nice cyclical flurries of local reporting on, on various particular prescribing changes. So I think October last year we had a few weeks of Viagra. And then March, we had a few weeks of Orlistat, which is the, um, the anti-obesity drug. And then most recently, we've had some exciting interest in methadone um, and medical cannabis. But I wanted to end this introduction on an example of um, open prescribing being used in service analytics. So this is um, a paper published by um, the uh, National Medicine Safety Improvement Program team in NHS England, some work that they did um, referencing uh, some work that we published on um, high-risk prescri prescribing of oral methotrexate. So they um, uh, did a quality improvement um, intervention, uh, working with eight ICSs to try and reduce this high-risk prescribing. So they wanted to reduce the level of co-prescribing of 2.5 and 10 milligram um, oral methotrexate, um, which would cause harm to patients. Um, and so they worked with those eight ICSs and achieved a reduction in seven ICSs of that high-risk prescribing. And the monitoring of that prescribing behaviour was done using open prescribing data. Um, and, uh, and that obviously is, is very important that uh, we use that. And it's actually uh, led to improvement um, in the prescribing behaviours and ultimately reduction in harm to, to patients, which is 
which is very exciting and always what we want to achieve. Um, so on that note, I'm going to hand over to Brian for a demo. I've got to ask for volunteers in a moment, but unlike every other presentation, feel free to take out your mobile phone and go look at open prescribing. Go look at your local practice and what's happening. Thank you, Christine. That's brilliant. <laughs> and while we're doing that, can I have a volunteer, maybe someone to call out their practice or their CCG that they work at or live at or use, that we can go and have a look at their prescribing? Cambridgeshire, okay, and this is not a plant, that's not someone from the Bennett Institute. <laughs> so we can see here on Open Prescribing dashboards for all these organisations across the NHS, all these three letter acronyms. Uh, so we're going to CC, what well, I call CCG, but are now sub ICB locations. Uh, and we're going for Cambridgeshire. Cambridgeshire and Petership, Peterborough, sorry. Okay, so this is a dashboard. All the dashboards look the same. Again, we are a bit lazy, we reuse everything but it makes it really easy to explore the site. Uh, we have 100 measures, as someone said earlier, on open prescribing in Cambridge and Petersburg. And this is what the teams, what the meds up team, so there's every CCG's pharmacy teams around the country, they'll be going in looking at this on a daily basis. On open prescribing, we have every measure arranged where there's uh, room for improvement, so compared to their peers. Now, show your charts. You're going to be looking at a lot of these today. So these are decile charts. So we've calculated rates for every prescribing. I'll come to some of the measures in a moment. The red line is the organization. So in this case, it's Cambridgeshire. The more solid blue dotted line is the English median. And then the blue decile. So first decile is the lowest 10% in England. And open prescribing, low is good everywhere we make a value judgment. So in open prescribing, if you're in Cambridge and Petersburg, you can go on here and see where the most amount of improvement can be made. So, what have we got? What do you like here about antibiotics or NSAIDs? Carol. Antibiotics. antibiotics. So, if you're in CCG here, you can go look. Oh, God, we're an outlier for this. What is it? So, these are, this is a measure around broad spectrum antibiotics. So, these are antibiotics we want to reserve uh, for really specialist cases. Uh, we want to use different antibiotics more commonly. Uh, in Cambridge and Petersburg, compared to their peers, they use lots of these antibiotics. So you can see they're the highest in the country for this. Uh, we might come to it later. There's been great reductions over the country in antibiotic prescribing to help with antimicrobial resistance. But if you're in the CCG, then you're like, okay, why are we, where are we going to go? How are we going to improve this? So you can then look at individual practices. You can maybe go and have a chat to them. Uh, and many, there's a few people here who are GP prescribing advisors. I was one before. You go maybe to Octagon and say, hey, acting on medical practice, why are you prescribing loads of antibiotics? Now, it may be that they're a soft touch, people are just coming in getting antibiotics, or maybe that they run a specialist clinic for specialist infections, maybe uh, sexually transmitted infections where they need more of these drugs. So there might be very good reasons why practices are using these. And then you can go down and you can go visit York Medical Street and you can see, oh, they were really high, but they've made lots of improvement recently. So you can go in and give them a good news story, which is always good when you have to deliver bad news. So back to the dashboard, we'll show you some other features. Um, staying here, bottom right, won't stay too long, but every practice. So nerds like us, we go and look at a lot of time, but most people just want a monthly summary of how they're doing, how they're, how they're driving, as TPP say. Um, so you can put in your email here and you get an update about your practice prescribing every month. Um, what else is on the dashboard? So we can look at savings on individual presentations. So. In the NHS, prescribing advice used to be really simple. You'd say, prescribe generically, it's safer, and it saves the NHS money. I think the King's Fund of Estimates saved about seven billion over the last few decades. Uh, the NHS pricing mechanism have got more complicated. There's a thing called the NHS drug tariff, which pays for every single prescription that a GP writes. And then, for example, it might be cheaper for a GP to prescribe a tablet or a capsule. And there's now brands. So traditionally, used to be brand name drugs were really, really expensive take advantage of some of the mechanisms of the NHS drug tariff, once a drug goes off patent, instead of bringing out a generic medicine, a company would bring out a brand medicine, but make it really cheap. Won't go into why that makes, but it makes the different unit cost of each medicine very, very different. We made a tool to work out what was the price per unit that everyone is paying, and work out how we could get that most efficiently, right, cheapest, to the patients. And not by some theoretical example, but look at what the best 10% of practice, or most efficient 10% of practices are doing. We can see here, so ventilofaxines and 
antidepressant. So in Cambridgeshire, they paid £1.15 for each individual unit of venlafaxine, but actually the most efficient 10% in the country is 35p. So that's quite a big saving. In uh, Cambridgeshire, it's uh, 9,000 a month they could save, and you can click in here, and we can see for Cambridge and Petersburg. So they prescribe actually quite a lot of generic venlafaxine, so that's good, that's the old NHS advice, a lot of people would say we should stick to that, but actually a lot of people in England are using these new brands, Vencarm, Vencin, Effexor is the originator brand, but are much cheaper. So again, this is a tool just to help people spot where they can see savings. Uh, for those that don't work in the NHS, I'm sure you can imagine we're under a lot of pressure at the moment to save savings. So this is another tool that can help people save savings. <coughs> right, volunteer over. There are pre-specified measures that offer up through our dashboards and emails. We also have an analyse page where anyone can go on and have a look at what anyone is prescribing in the country. So I'm just going to... So who's ever heard of parasizing an antipsychotic? One person who works at the Bennett Institute. <laughs> so again, you can put denominators, always give me a fairer comparison. So it's going to put Cambridgeshire, we can highlight what Cambridgeshire is doing. Uh, and then show me the data. And this is the live internet, it's not a special demo we've rigged up, it is this fast. Um, there we go, you can get bar charts of prescribing, you can get a nice time series chart, see hardly any prescribing in Cambridgeshire. Uh, below the dashboard, you get the figures, monthly totals. If you're interested in this drug, you can sign up for a monthly alert. So if there's a drug you're interested in, in a particular organisation, sign up for a monthly alert, get it into your inbox. You don't need to go near our website. Um, and we can see a map of parasizing and prescribing in the country. And you see what's happening in Norfolk. So parasizing, now we didn't find this randomly, we use innovative data science techniques to spot outliers. Uh, we found parasizing, that's not psychotic, I'd never heard of. One in five prescriptions in Norfolk are for parasizing, where in the rest of the country it's less than 1%. Shows you, open prescribing, we use these but you can use to spot outliers. Now there may be good reason why there's parasizing and prescribing in Norfolk, if you're from Norfolk, come see us later and tell us why they are good reasons. Uh, but there may be bad reasons, so we can use open prescribing different ways to share best practice, spot outliers, and ultimately improve prescribing. I'm going to go one final thing I'm going to show you. So the NHS, you may have seen in news stories, you may have seen Channel 4 had two minutes and 30 seconds a few months ago on prime time with open prescribing in the background. There's a lot of drug shortages in the NHS. Um, where things are short, but they're still available, uh, pharmacies and the government negotiate what's called a price concession. That's an in-month adjustment to the drug prices. Um, and in every CCG, every NHS organisation across the country, there's some uh, poor sod with an Excel file, getting Excel files from all over the internet and calculating how much that is for uh, their organisation. Using open prescribing and methods and the uh, stuff we've built up, we're able to build automatic generators. So here we have uh, drug shortage pricing, and you can see very, very low. You can see it spikes after Brexit, coincidentally, I'm told, um, and comes during COVID. We've had lots of trouble. This is huge price pressures on the NHS due to the unavailability of some common generic prices. But again, email address. You know, used to be people would have to go calculate that themselves. Uh, as soon as these prices are um, announced, we're able to bang our email in there, and it comes right into your inbox. And that is a live demo of open prescribing, which is very easy to do once you get your computer working. Who's next? Hello, uh, I'm Peter, and I run the data team at the Ben Institute. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about automation, by which I mean uh, getting machines to do, the, to do the boring stuff so that we can get on with the interesting stuff. Uh, I'll take our work with price, price, con price concessions as an example. Uh, I want to show you how uh, our concessions reports uh, end up in an email that, uh, that gets sent to a few hundred uh, medicines optimi optimizations teams, practice managers, journalists, and other interested people. The data lives uh, in a, um, a website published by the um, Pharmaceutical Services <coughs> Negotiating Committee. Uh, we have a little computer program uh, called a scraper uh, that fetches this web page, uh, extracts structured data from it attempts to match uh, the drug names against drugs that we know about and updates our database. 
This is all work that a human could do, um, but it's time consuming, error prone, and probably quite boring. So when this web page is updated, a notification email is sent. When one of our team receives this email, they type a command into Slack, which is the uh, chat program we use at the Bennett Institute. We've got a, a little bot uh, called Bennett Bot, which listens for instructions in Slack. And when it gets this instruction, it runs the scraper. When the scraper is finished, it reports on how many new concessions it found and whether there are any concessions that it couldn't automatically match against uh, drugs in our database. If so, we can manually uh, reconcile them using more um, commands in Slack. And then once we've checked that the, the, the numbers that we're reporting on the open prescribing website look sensible, we run one last command which sends the emails to anybody who has subscribed. When you sign up for emails, you can choose to receive them so that they're customised to your organ organisation, whether that's your uh, practice, your CCG or NHS England. Uh, the email for uh, NHS England looks like this, showing the total estimated um, cost uh, of this month's price concessions, as well as the drugs that contribute the most to the extra cost, um, and an indication of how this month compares with uh, the last five years. Um, over the years, uh, this piece of automation has saved countless hours of manual labour in spreadsheets uh, in medicines optimisation optimi teams across the country. And I think it demonstrates uh, the value of software engineers working very closely with um, subject experts. In this case, it was a, a, a CCG pharmacist, uh, Rich, who came up with the idea and guided the work. Uh, while well, Dave and I, Dave speaking a bit, uh, wrote the code, uh, wrote different parts of the code over a few days uh, several years ago. Uh, but in other cases, uh, it's been our subject experts like Nick with his clinical trials reporting uh, who have learned enough about programming to be able to automate uh, the large boring parts of their work to allow them to focus on the interesting stuff. If you're interested in learning more, uh, I'd suggest taking a look at a book called Automate the Boring Stuff with Python. It's um, freely available online. Uh, or you can come and talk to me or anybody else um, who looks uh, nerdy uh, <laughs> and uh, talk to me about learning to program during the next break. So thank you. Hi, I'm Dave. Uh, I'm one of the software developers. And uh, back in 2019, I led a project to uh, uh, replace the number crunching core that um, powers open prescribing. And I'm going to talk about why we did that and how. So, we used to think that the prescribing data set was just too big to be usable in an interactive website, like querying it was just too slow. And so we used this service called Google BigQuery to um, kind of pre-digest the raw data down to something more manageable. But that limited the kinds of features we could build for users because we didn't have the flexibility to change the, the queries we were doing on demand. Like too much was fixed up front in that big query pre-digestion step. So the challenge was, can we make something that's fast enough that we don't need to pre-digest stuff? We can just query the full data set uh, live interactively. To answer that, let's do some computer science. How fast can a modern processor access data? But the fastest thing you can read from are the tiny blocks of memory that come built into the processor core. And they're called caches. And you can read from your L1 cache in about one nanosecond. But it's hard to picture a nanosecond, so let's multiply it by a billion and imagine that takes one second. And if that takes one second, how long, in relative terms, does it take to read from RAM, from your, your main computer memory? Answer, about a minute and a half. And what about SSD, solid state drive? They're the kind of fancy, expensive, whizzy hard drives. Um, well, they'll get your data in one to two days. Uh, and a traditional hard drive, like the kind they call spinning rust sometimes, quite rudely, uh, four to eight months. And if your data's in the cloud, you're going to be waiting years. So, two things are hopefully obvious from that. One is that you really, really want your data in RAM. You want to be getting stuff in seconds and minutes, or nanoseconds and nanominutes, <coughs> not in days and months. And two, it matters how your data is structured in RAM. So if you can arrange things so you're doing lots of those fast one nanosecond cache reads and then only occasionally reaching out to RAM to pull in more data, your code will run much more quickly than if you're constantly hopping back and forth between the two. And the technical term here is cache locality. You want 
data structures and code that have good cache locality. Right, back to prescribing. You can ask how much of this drug did that practice prescribe in this month, but that number in isolation isn't terribly useful. What you really want to know is how does that number compare to what other practices are doing, and how have all those numbers changed across time? In other words, we're not interested in individual numbers, we're interested in matrices. And you can think of matrix here as just like a fancy pants maths word for a big table of numbers. Uh, in this case, spread across time, which is the columns, and practices, which are the rows. And matrices, it turns out, are really, can be really fast to work with because you can structure them uh, in such a way they make efficient use of RAM and they have good cache locality. And there are some great open source libraries that, that do a lot of that work for you. So we took a bunch of open source libraries and we restructured our data as matrices and we were able to produce what is effectively a database specifically optimized for prescribing data. We call it the matrix store. Um, and it lets us query the, the full prescribing data set, every drug, every practice over the last five years in, in tens of milliseconds. And the, the point isn't being fast for its own sake. The point is if you can make things fast enough that you can query the raw, undigested data, it fundamentally changes the way you can interact with it. It changes the kinds of analysis you're able to do. It changes the kind of tools you're able to build. Uh, and that's what the Matrix Store does for open prescribing. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, so you've heard in great depth how we take the prescribing data and um, turn it into the openprescribing.net service. I'm going to tell you about how we also, alongside that, do research on the same data. So papers are great. Uh, we like papers and we do lots of papers. But a couple of limitations of them it is, firstly, they go out of date over time. Um, so the data gets more and more stale the, the older the paper is. And then the other thing is you're limited to the data that's presented in the paper. You can't go and look at exactly what you want because you're limited to just what we've put in there. Um, so wherever possible for open prescribing papers, we've tried to, alongside the paper, build a live tool that allows you to interact with the data um, that's more up to date and um, and, and more sort of customised. And then the other aspect, as you've heard from various people, is we always publish the open code alongside the, the paper. So every, paper, so every study we do has a paper, an interactive tool, and open code. So for example, one of the genres of open prescribing paper we've done is trends and variations. So that's trends over time, how, how prescribing has changed over time, and then variation across the country, across different um, organizations. An example of that is opioids. So you might have heard of the opioid crisis. That's a particularly a US phenomenon, but it's also, it also happens here. Um, so we showed that there was a massive increase in, uh, so this graph here is uh, particularly high dose opioids, which are a particularly problematic sort of opioids. Uh, and that sort of prescribing has increased many fold between 1988 and 2016. Um, obviously, 26, the, the last year on that paper is uh, 2017, so that's already getting quite stale. So we, you can actually go and look at openprescribing.net and look at how opioid prescribing is uh, going at the moment, and you can see it's actually trending downwards, which is great. Uh, and then, of course, we published the code alongside. Uh, we're also very interested in things that make people change their prescribing behaviour. So this is one of the open prescribing measures. It's um, trimethoprim and uh, nitrofurantoin. They are drugs that, that they are antibiotics that are used to treat urinary tract infections. In 2014, uh, Public Health England issued guidance to say you need to start using nitrofurantoin as first-line treatment because there's lots of um, there's lots of resistance against trimethoprim. Uh, as you can see, th so that that first black line is where that guidance was issued, and you can see some people sort of noticed, but a lot of people just carried on as they were. 
Um, it's only when you get to the second set of lines, the, the sort of yellow and, and blue lines, uh, which is where something called the quality premium was introduced, uh, which is where you pay people to change their prescribing behavior that people actually started to pay attention. Uh, and then we're really interested in how individual organizations cha change their behavior. So you can see that some change uh, much earlier and some change later and some change quickly and some change slowly. Um, so one of the things we, we did um, to sort of try and get a bit more insight into why people are doing better and worse is we sent freedom of information requests to uh, all of the CCGs in, in England. Uh, Sorry, it wasn't all of them. It was the top 10, 10 CCGs and the bottom 10 CCGs in terms of this prescribing measure. And we asked them what they were doing to improve their prescribing in, in terms of this measure. So we asked the top 10 and nearly all of them had some sort of plan to, to do something about it. So a, a formula change, a work plan or a, an incentive scheme. And then we asked the bottom 10 and none of them had any of those. So, you know, paying people to do things and actually trying seems to have, a, <laughs> have an effect. Uh, so we're also interested in measuring global changes in, in prescribing. So in 2013, the chief medical officer uh, highlighted the need for strong action on reducing antibiotic prescribing uh, to, to fight antimicrobial resistance. Um, we wanted to see if that had made, made, made a difference in terms of overall prescribing. So we added up all of the antibiotic prescribing in, across all of England over time. And then we did something called interrupted time series analysis, which is where you measure the slope of the line before the intervention was made and then afterwards. And then you, you ask the, the maths if it thinks that they were different. And it turns out they were. Um, we don't know if that was definitely due to the intervention of the chief medical officer, but it's certainly a possibility. Uh, and of course, you can look at the prescribing of antibiotics on openprescribing.net. That spike at the end there is the strep A uh, in children situation. Uh, then email alerts. Brian was talking about email alerts. Uh, so this is obviously a, a service that Open Prescribing runs now. Uh, it does two things. Um, firstly, it tells you whether you're especially good or especially bad at any of the open prescribing measures. That's easy to do, you just take the top 10% or the bottom 10% of people and send emails to those people. Um, we also wanted to t tell people if their prescribing was improving relative to their peers, uh, and that's much more challenging. So to illustrate that, this is another of the open prescribing measures. Um, this is desigestrel, which is an oral contraceptive. In 2013, the uh, started to be cheap generic versions of it available, uh, so it was best to pres prescribe the, the generic version. And you can see lots of people uh, paid attention to this and started changing to, to prescribing generically. The, the red line is a, an individual organisation and they sort of carried on as they were and f for about a year after, after, their, after the cheap versions uh, became available. So we really wanted a machine that could tell this organization, hey, look, everybody's changed their prescribing. Maybe you should think about doing that too. And then you'd be able to avoid all of that extra year of expensive prescribing. Uh, so I'm not going to go into the details. You can read the paper if you're interested. But we did uh, something called, uh, we used a statistical process control uh, method called cum cumulative sum. Uh, and that you don't need to understand these graphs, but the red dots there um, indicate where we would have sent alerts to that practice. Uh, and you, you maybe can't see, but the, it, it shows that it would have sent an alert in mid-2013, which is when the, the, the generic became available. Um, so go read the paper if you're interested in the details. Uh, and this is an example of one of the, um, one of the alerts that that we send, send out. As you can see, the, the red line there is fairly flat overall in, in the sort of last part, but everybody else has decreased, so their, their sort of relative performance compared to everyone else has, has gone up. Uh, so that's, that's what we're really interested in telling people. 
Uh, we've also looked at other ways of uh, detecting changes in organisations' uh, behaviour. So this is an, another uh, fancy maths technique that I only half understand. Uh, it was developed by an economist called Felix Pratis, and he uses it for finding changes in uh, climate data. Uh, but we've adapted it to use uh, to, to look at prescribing data, so we can use that to identify the timing and the the magnitude of changes, and also how fast they happen, so the kind of slope of the change. Um, so we wrote that up in a lovely BMJ paper, uh, and we've since um, sort of um, applied that to a few different situations. One of them is going back to opioids. So these are practices that prescribed lots of high dose opioids and they've uh, reduced up prescribing almost none. And all of these practices were identified in an auto autonomous way amongst 8,000 practices in, in England. Uh, we, we've used that tool to, to sort of extract the interesting bits and found people who've changed in a really positive way. And we'd like to do lots more of that and, and, and also go out and talk to people who've made these really good changes and, and find out what they did. Uh, so lastly, um, we're really keen on measuring the impact of the tools that we uh, create. Um, so Brian showed you the price per unit tool, which is the one with the funny coloured blobs that allows you to prescribe the same drug but a different version of that, that drug and, and save money. Uh, so, um, when this service had been running for a little while, uh, we could look at the organisations whose pages have been viewed, and then we can compare the prescribing before um, that page was viewed to the subsequent prescribing, and, um, and then we can think about w whether that was lower than we'd expect or higher. And it turns out, we did this study, uh, and practices on average uh, prescribed lower, is it pre the, the prescribing was cheaper after the, their page had been viewed than uh, before. So this is somewhat back of the envelope uh, maths, uh, it, but yeah, we, th we think in total there were uh, 1.7 million pounds in savings. If everybody in England used the open prescribing service, so if we extrapolate to, to all practices in England, that would um, somewhat hopefully come up with a figure of 27 million, which would be lovely. Uh, so that's it from me, and now Brian is going to talk about an uh, in depth bit of uh, research. It's going to be sick to death to hear about price for you, and then this talk. <laughs> One final thing so I was in Wakefield a few years ago four or five years ago, giving a talk to about two, three hundred GPs on the PPU tool, much like you heard earlier in the talk from Alex. I'm staying at the middle of it, GP front row stuck up his hand. I was like, oh, don't like questions right in the middle of my talk. But I was like, come on, what's the question? He goes, wait, I know what you've said, but with the generic prescribing, why is there loads of little dots beside the atorvastatin? The three sat in front of 200 GPs. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> I'll uh, come back to you next week. And I did, and that's why everyone should put their questions on the VBOX, and we will get back to you. But so I went back to Data Lab HQ, because I had no idea, because when you prescribe generic atorvastatin, it's the most common drug used for cholesterol in this country, uh, it should be the same price, should be the same price everywhere. So, first of all, um, Peter Dave said went to work, we're like, there must be something wrong with the code in open prescribing, maybe there's a bug somewhere. We've got open code, so it's very easy for us all to check, some of us weren't around at the time. Couldn't work it out, could not see anything we could wrong. We started doing all sorts of fancy pants analysis, we got data sets from community farms, we were trying to work out was there some unusual charge that was being made in Wakefield, couldn't find anything. So, we went back to the NHS Business Service Authority. So these are the people in Newcastle who get all the prescriptions from across the country, 1.1 billion of them. They scan them into their computers and they produce the CSV at the end of the month on how much GPs are paid. So I said to them, we can't, we can't work out what this is. They said, oh, well, it's manufactured generics. And, oh, what's that? But I like why it's good to have good relationships with people who make the data and then we take it and use it, but you always have to go back to data producers. So we went, so what is it? So what are manufactured generics? So first off, this is a generic drug. It's one common contraceptive. We know it's a generic 
drug because there's huge debate on how you actually pronounce it. We think it's called Cyprin Dial, but there's other, uh, other shades of pronunciation on that. That's a generic drug, Dianet. This is the traditional brand name originate drug. It's really expensive, Cosyprin Dial, really, really cheap. I mentioned branded generics earlier, so Claret. It's in between, and that's a brand that was allowed to come out once the paint expired. Instead of producing a generic, they produce a brand, priced it in between the other two and tried to take advantage of uh, loopholes in the interest drug tariff. Now what manufactured generics are, Cosyprin now brackets Morningside. Now to you, that looks like a generic, it looks like a generic name to me. That is actually a brand name. So Morningside, in their wisdom, and using a loophole in the MHRA name convention of drugs, made their brand name look like a generic name with their own company in the title. The important bit about this is, it's the same price as Claret. It's expensive, same price as Dianet. It's expensive, so it's an expensive brand name, although it looks like a generic name. It's a really important thing. Something the BSA do, and I still don't know why they do this, uh, they treat this for the purposes of paying pharmacies, as a brand, they paid a really expensive price, but then they put it into the generic part of the data set. So you've got, it looks like a generic item, but it's priced really expensive. And that gives us the long tail, but it's hiding in plain sight. So we call this ghost branded generics. Really spooky, it's in the data set, can't find it, great name. Uh, but now we had that information. There's no way, you know, uh, people are doing it. Everyone's told to prescribe generically, and if they prescribe a brand name, they go and look for something that looks like a brand name. But we went and we looked, 11.6 million pounds, we reckon, every year were attributed to these ghost branded generics. Now, I was sitting down there, I was like, there are some occasions where a GP or pharmacist will take a generic name and they want to specify the manufacturer's name. So the classic case is epilepsy, but there'll be some patients who won't react well to some generics because there's a particular type of lactose in it and they need one specific manufacturer. BSA returns, loads of people do this. Right? There's no way there's that many patients that cost 11.6 million pounds. So back to Data Lab HQ as it was at the time. So if you look down the back of the sofa, we had a file down the back of the sofa around what computer system each GP in the country uses. So nowadays there's two, EMIS and TPP, you'll hear a lot more about later. So we threw this into the analysis. And what were we found? All the cost was attributed to the TPP system one system. So 11.6 million pounds of these ghost branded generics was all going into system one. So hang on a minute, what's going on here? So I cycled up to Isn't Central Medical Centre, which I think rang someone to go look at uh, someone down in Devon since this month. And we looked at the two main systems, EMIS and TPP. System one. Now, on system one, probably quite rightly, they had all the generics and all the brands, and the Cosipernal brackets Morningside was in with the brands, although it was up the top because of alphabetical ordering. Um, when you issued a prescription, it was quite easy to say it looks like a generic, and where it was on the user interface was presented first. So you can see a GP would just click it, thinking you know, it's the same as everything else. Uh, when I tried to do that on EMIS web, it wouldn't. It would just print off as generic prescription. So EMIS designed it, couldn't do it. TPP, quite logical implementation, but it was called, I was allowed to issue these prescriptions. Um, sorry, oh my God, what are we going to do about this? So we wrote about this. We wrote a blog on the 20th of December, 2018. In retrospect, I think we ruined a few people's Christmases, which uh, Apologies, everyone's here, we'll buy you some warm Pinot Grigio later. Um, ben tweeted it at 2.40 p.m. in 2018. Went mad, so everyone saw this was happening. The TPB system one, there was a problem here. Costing the NHS an extra 11.6 million pounds. And credit to TPP, they left their Christmas party. They rang us straight up and they were like, what's going on? Said, I think it's this. They went, oh, okay, leave it with us. We'll get back to you. Uh, so straight after Christmas, and this is Robin Conabere tweeted, TPP rolled out new tools, so they saw, yeah, this is fair enough. Real-time analysis had spotted, you know, a logical user interface just at the time, but our uh, monitoring had showed up that it was a problem. They rolled that problem out, and it's from our paper in the British Journal of General Practice, so the green line, which is the moon going up like that, is TPP over the last 
well, 28 teams last eight years, was just skyrocketing because there was more of these types of ghost branded generics coming out. Um, but the really, really great thing is, as soon as we spot, as soon as TPP rolled it out, you can see at the very end of the chart, bang, starts coming down. Almost immediately, this change from us as researchers working with TPP, and the inbound change in front of GPs within a few weeks, their whole user interface had changed, and they started saving the NHS money. And that is how we became friends with TPP, and how we eventually went on to build OpenSafely. Mm -hmm.